everyone. Welcome to America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna. I'm so excited. We have my brother in studio today. And, you know, this being a particular month in the United States of America, where it's known as Pride Month, I tell you, this is a month for us to be really, really proud to be having conversations like this. Sit back, relax, and share with your friends a conversation that it's all about inclusion, diversity, acceptance, determination, courage, and honesty. As I sit and have a conversation with Prince Manvendra Singh Gohil from the Rajpipla dynasty. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. I've enjoyed our time together that has been spent. Thank you so much for having me here. You have one of the warmest hearts I've ever met in a prince. Thank you. And I was telling you how many of my friends belong to various royal dynasties. And so it's nothing new for me to sit and have a heart to heart conversation with a culture that many people don't really understand. What was it like growing up in your world? Tell us a little bit about maybe the first 15 years. Many people ask me this question that, um, I mean, uh, how are you different than us? Uh, I tell them that, yeah, uh, though we don't have the powers to rule as we had in the past before uh, India got independent, but still we are the custodian of this rich cultural heritage, which we have inherited from our ancestors. And our dynasty is pretty old. It's, it dates back to the 13th century. So it's now more than 600 years of our dynasty. And I'm the 39th direct descendant of this Gohil dynasty dating back to 1380. Mm. So uh, uh, we are groomed by our retainers, by our staff, by our uh, uh, people of the kingdom uh, to be the future custodian. And the entire grooming happens uh, since the time you are a child uh, to prepare us uh, for the future. In fact, one of the things, interesting things, which I would like to tell you is that uh, when I was born and I was born as the first male child of the family as the crown prince of Rajpipla, my name was actually registered with the Ministry of Home Affairs Government of India. Mm. Now, uh, that, that doesn't happen in any other family, you know, so that itself, uh, my birth itself um, make, made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, when I was growing up, uh, all the etiquettes, all the protocols or the do's and don'ts and were taught, we are, we are brought up in a very protected atmosphere. And there are certain expectations which people have from us. So how we sit, how we behave, how we talk in public, uh, how we walk, uh, everything matters. And we are always in the public eye, you know, we are, we are, our lives are not private. We are being watched. There is media, there was, you know, uh, I mean, now people tell me, oh, you're facing media so well. I said, well, I mean, I've been facing media ever since I was five years old, you know. I mean, there I've been coming in the newspapers. My my birth itself uh, came in the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I, I was just a child of uh, nine years old. I was invited as a chief guest for a school annual event. <laughs> and I was put on the stage and made to address uh, the whole school, the students, the, the teachers, that doesn't happen in other families, <laughs> you know, so that that's how it's different. Yeah. But one thing which um, I like to share is uh, that um, there is no love and affection between us and, and our parents. We well, not like average people where average people kiss and hug yes, and maul that, each no, other. That's not there. In fact, I wasn't even raised by my mother. I was raised by my nanny, yes. a governess, who was an employee staff of the royal family in fact she raised my mother as well so i was the second generation she raised and uh, when i was very young um, uh, i i always thought she was my mother because mm. she was the one who used to take care of me right since the time i get up in the morning till i go to, go to sleep she used to sleep next to me mm -hmm. and sing me a lullaby so naturally i mean somebody who takes care of you you think that she is the mother and and when i came to a certain age uh, she used to, I used to argue with her when she used to tell me that she is not my mother. And then I said, no, <laughs> you're lying, you know, and I would cry and then uh, make a fuss about it. She would say, no, I don't even resemble you. Uh, the, your, your mother is, I said, yeah, she is a beautiful woman with a lot of makeup and all. But she, <laughs> but she cannot be my mother because she doesn't talk to me. Oh, wow. So I have grown up with that uh, 
in my name when I was I used to But that's see, a very uh, common thing, you know, in yeah, many royal families. Yeah. That's very common. That's very common, but people yes. don't talk about it. Yeah, but they don't the know about it because it's so normal yeah, for you. Exactly. But for us, yeah. we're like, oh, but you should have been hugged and yes, yes. cajoled by yeah. your parents. So I, I have I have missed those things in life. By our biological parents. In fact, sometimes I have even heard people telling me, "Is she really your mother? Is she your stepmother?" Mm. And then I would say, "Well, she is my mother. Uh, yeah. I mean, she has given birth to me. But uh, I mean, your mothers uh, are like you know are uh, showing their affection towards you, but my mother doesn't. I mean, I have my nanny who does it. You know. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So that has been my childhood, uh, and. Um, uh, like, so you're uh, out there and you're speaking on stages at age nine yeah. and you're taken care of by your nanny and you're groomed. I like the way they use that word. I'm, I was groomed how to sit, how to walk, how to talk, how to eat. And usually I know in the British royal dynasty, you never get a picture of them eating. It's like against the law, yes, you yes. know. Uh. So these seem like small things to the average person. Right. But to individuals who know that you're upholding a kingdom, you are upholding a legacy, a rulership, it's huge because yes. it's about your principles and your values. There was something about you that was really going on inside of you behind your eyes, which maybe your nanny knew but didn't even know how to articulate it. Mm -hmm. There was a part of you that was not feeling that you were what you saw in the mirror. Mm. Could you talk about that to us? Yeah. So, uh, see, when I was uh, kind of going through the adolescent uh, stage, uh, that's when, you know, normally we kind of discover ourselves and discover our sexual self, if I, if I may be more specific. And um, I studied in a co-education school where, where we had boys and girls together, but uh, I was never attracted towards uh, the opposite sex. Um, I was, uh, I, I have a lot of girlfriends, I still have a lot of girlfriends, but I never, uh, like, you know, uh, was attracted towards them. They were, I, I, on the contrary, uh, I used to not like when the boys used to bully the girls. Mm. So I used to like, you know, come and stand by them and protect them. And all the girls were extremely fond of me, you know, <laughs> they, they, they would all come to me and then share their lunch boxes and all that with me because they were very fond of me. They didn't like the boys, they liked me. And I used to wonder that why I'm the only boy who who likes like does like this. You know, none of my other the boys in my class, uh, you know, they are pulling the hair, they're pulling ponytails of the girls, and I didn't like that the way they used to they used to behave. And I didn't know why I'm behaving in this manner, why this attraction is there towards the same. I mean, I had attraction, but I didn't like the boys in that that manner. You know, like I didn't like to make friends with them, but uh, but I had an attraction towards them. Mm. And uh, I had no answer to that question because we were raised in such a protected atmosphere. And main thing was there was no exposure out to to the outside world at all. Uh, and when I mean exposure, like there was no chance that I could talk to somebody else. Mm. It was always guarded. Always somebody was there with me, so there was no chance given. And in those days, there was no access to social media or cell phones or things. Which are which are there now? We just had one landline, you know, <laughs> and that also was monitored, you know, not like you know available and accessible to you all the time. Yeah. Uh, and my nanny was absolutely uneducated. She had uh, no understanding of of any sort, which I could go to her and tell. So I I brought, I kind of grew up thinking maybe this is a passing phase in my life, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll come out of it. Maybe uh, I'm the only one of this sort who's having this kind of a uh, behavior or I, I don't know whether it is a disease or is something wrong with me uh, but why why am I uh, different you know I had no clue or no answer to my uh, question yeah, yeah yeah it must have been a lonely period for you I mean not just lonely being in the palace but just lonely with these feelings yes it was yeah it was very lonely and you know many times people have asked me who are your friends when you're growing up and I, I, I would tell them that uh, my friends were animals mm. and birds. I used to rescue a lot of birds, especially birds when I was a child, uh, because uh, uh, in India we have this kite festival and a lot of birds get injured when, you know, kites are flying in the sky and uh, they just come in, in between and um, kites capture their space, you know, <laughs> basically. So I used to, you know, whenever any bird would get injured, I would bring it home, nurse them. And, uh, 
bandage them and then release them. So I, I loved animals and I love birds and uh, I, had, I had rescued some birds and those birds refused to leave me and go away. They lived with me, you know, they would not like to go back to their homes. So I, I, they were my friends. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I kind of lived with them, I, I, my animals, my birds, my, the plants, yeah. they were my friends. I had no friends in uh, humans. It, it's interesting, you know, because from the outside in, um, when we look at your life and many other lives of royalty, it is so large. And then when you go inside these walls, it is large in terms of its principles, its ethics, its values, but it's yet so simple. And when you talk about your birds and your animals were your friends, the outside world would think that you had a million people who were your friends because they could see that. So when you reach that particular point where you could not keep these feelings inside of you anymore, what was that point that was the turnaround for you that said, I have to be myself? What was happening with you on the inside? And what gave you the courage to say, I have to be me? I have to let everybody know this is who I am. So uh, I call myself, uh, or rather, I used to call myself a person who's living in a prison, in a prison, in a prison. Mm. So uh, I'll explain how that is. Like, first of all, uh, to be born in a royal, I won't say prison, but yeah, kind of a, 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 a protected area. So where when you're born in a royal family, you have to, uh, you know, uh, accept the fact that you'll be born with a lot of protocols and protections and all that. So that was one one area of uh, protection which I had. Uh, the other area was uh, uh, I uh, like came to terms with my sexuality, uh, but I wasn't open about it. So that was another uh, uh, prison. prison within me uh, that uh, I am uh, uh, born in a royal family. I am born as a gay. Uh, and the third thing was that I was uh, uh, not uh, like you know comfortable talking about it because uh, uh, i was scared that how people would uh, mm -hmm. react that's why i say i was in a prison in a prison in a prison mm -hmm. and i said i have to break free from this because this is too suffocating a world you know you can't just keep living in this atmosphere where you're not given the freedom you're not given the independence of who you want to be and who you want who you are mm -hmm. and it was like you know uh, i give this example of a dog which is chained Dog is an animal uh, which needs freedom. Or, for mm -hmm. example, you have a have a bird in a cage. Yeah. A bird in a in a cage is uh, is uh, you know you you need to give that bird the freedom to fly. Uh, uh, otherwise, it doesn't have a meaning to that bird's life. Mm -hmm. So I said I have to break these shackles. I have to break these prisons and set myself free um, because it's, it had reached to that point in my life that I couldn't take it anymore. And therefore, I broke all my three prisons by <laughs> three, those uh, shackles in which I was confined to. And uh, I, I kind of just um, broke loose and, sh and just set myself free. And um, how did it feel I the felt, day after? I, I sincerely uh, felt a sense of big relief, sense uh, that a big burden has come down my shoulders because I never liked to live a hypocrite's life. Mm -hmm. I was always wanted to live life of truth and honesty, true to myself and true to others. But I was being forced to live a life of lie and a double life, uh, which wasn't uh, comfortable to me. And uh, it was always uh, kind of pinching me from inside that, no, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and when you when you realize you do something wrong, then then comes fear. <laughs> you know, so there, there are multiple uh, consequences uh, yeah. to, to that, you know, it's just not one thing, one thing leads to another, the, that leads to a third thing. So when all that was removed, uh, I came to a state where, where I was kind of uh, uh, living my life, living, the, living my, the life of honesty, the life I wanted to live, and uh, without fear of, uh, you know, uh, and therefore when people ask me that, uh, uh, but uh, everyone was against you. Then why weren't you scared? I said, well, uh, my biggest fear was um, that I was uh, not truthful to myself. Yeah, yeah. So when I started becoming truthful to myself, those fears went away. Of course. They're gone. People may go against me, the whole world may go against me. 
But as long as I am true to myself, uh, I don't have to fear anything. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's interesting because the prison and the prison and the prison, that was one factor and it was quiet and it was private. And then you broke those shackles and now you are who you need to be at least. You're evolving into that person still, aren't you? Yes. And then you encounter other difficulties which were not in the prison. No. Could you share a little bit of those? Yeah, there were a lot of difficulties. I mean, I faced. I mean, I I was prepared because I I knew that uh, people are not going to accept the truth. I mean, it, it's uh, it's said truth is always bitter. You know, we are we are so used to living in this fake world that somebody says something true and they said, oh my God, that person said this. <laughs> and you know, people are not ready. You know, the the people are not ready to accept the truth. Uh, that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, but. I said it and I said, I'm not going back on it. People were coming and telling me, please go and tell that whatever you said was wrong. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Why should I, when, I, when it is something true, if true? I want orange, it is orange. You cannot make it black, you know? I so know. I said, I'm not going to go back and tell that I've said something wrong. And uh, on the contrary, I will say what I said was true. You know, there was something that you shared that, you know, you were interviewed by Oprah Winfrey three times. Yes. And as a result of her first interview, there were laws that were enacted in India yeah. for the LBGTQ community. Yeah, yeah. Then they rolled it back. Then you went back on her show again, mm. and then they made some changes. Then yeah. you went back again for her to look into your, your journey. But there was one thing that Oprah said, which was really, really endearing. And she said, I've interviewed the tops of the tops, the Bill Clintons, the this, the that, but you, were one of the most honest people I've ever interviewed. Yes. How did that make you feel? That is one of the best compliments I've ever received from anyone in my life. And yeah. that is something which has given me even more strength. You know, when people say, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the, this, this kind of problems is coming to you. I said, whatever problems will come to me, I will, I will face it because uh, and in like in Hindi, there is a, there is a phrase which I is we often use Satya Meva Jayate, truth will always win. Mm. Uh, so honesty, I have, and uh, and Oprah was you know she observed it. She said yes, uh, uh, I'm not a fake person. I and you know people had scared me when I was going to on a show. Literally, people had scared me. Oprah is a very difficult woman. She will take. She will like you know really will, will she drill she, you? Yeah, yeah, drill you. And this. I said, what will she do to me? I mean, I'm I'm an open person. I'm an open individual. What what is she going to drill out of me? You know. Yeah, it was this a thing. wonderful so interview. She 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 made me feel so comfortable. She yeah. she uh, like she was a wonderful person, and uh, she gave me so much of positive energy when I was that positive aura I could feel around her. Yes, she definitely you know? has She that. has that positive aura, which you have to experience it, you know, uh, yeah. and uh, and this this was one of the best compliments I could ever get. I mean, imagine interviewing so many people in so many years of her life Career. and then telling but me that. But we feel that. We yeah. feel that with you. We spent the day together today, and I enjoyed every minute of it. And you shared with me a story that was very heartwarming, just because your whole energy, everyone, his energy is just so warm and loving and, and truthful and kind. And remember, I said something to you at lunch today, and I said, because of your vibration and the person that you are, even if anyone was to do anything bad to you, they would do a turnaround, yes. their conscience would hit them. Tell us that story you told me at lunch about the guy who came to do you some harm. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, like um, uh, one of the um, obstacles I, uh, I would use. One of the word, many. Many of the <laughs> many, which I was facing other than my effigies getting burnt and getting thrown out and disinherited and all that. Uh, <laughs> I started receiving death threats. Now, very interestingly, when I made the com I statement in the newspaper, I said, I may be the first member of a royal family to come out openly as gay, but not the only one, which meant that there were there were many royals who were hide, uh, who were hiding in their uh, closet. You know, in the the, in the, the uh, I, I I I jokingly use the word lot of queens hiding in the, in the <laughs> royal closet, and they were literally scared. They said, "Now this guy has become shameless, and he's he's like you know just uh, uh, talking about uh, these issues and." 
time will come when the entire royal families of india will be you know uh, their reputation will be tarnished and we need to uh, silence him and they tried their best but i wasn't getting silenced i was just keeping on talking and then they said that now the only way to silence is kill him you know so i started getting their threats that uh, you better shut up otherwise we will kill you i said okay uh, I mean, killing me is not going to stop the LGBT movement. On the contrary, it's going to get even stronger. So I don't mind if my life is taken. We take him. Doesn't matter. No, issue, no big deal about it. You know. But I was cautious also. I used to like you know, uh, uh, like check my brakes of the car and uh, just be cautious and be aware of things. So uh, otherwise, I said whatever it has will have to happen will happen. I mean, I don't need to be killed by somebody. I can die some other way yeah, also. You know, yeah. the death is nobody. Is nobody's hand. Like you can, how you will die and where you will die, nobody can say. So uh, fine. One day I was just sitting uh, by somewhere, and uh, one guy comes to me and says, uh, uh, "Sir, I want to uh, um, discuss something with you." So I said, "Yeah, go. Please go ahead." Uh, he said, "No, no. There are there are a lot of people. Uh, can I come uh, in, a, in a secluded plot and I want to talk to you something very confidential." I said, okay, uh, let's go somewhere. And then we went to some a part and uh, then he, he confided to me, uh, I want to tell you something very important. Um, I was hired to kill you. I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so now what's the plan? Um, <laughs> I'm here. I'm available to you. I don't have, you can check my pockets. I don't have any um, guns or weapons, anything for self-defense. I'm just standing in front of you. Do your job. He said, no, sir, um, it failed. So I said, okay, then what is going to happen? What is, what is the next step? He said, I have, I have been living this for such a long time and uh, I have been feeling extremely guilty for uh, what I has been supposed to do. And I have come here for seeking uh, forgiveness, for mm -hmm. seeking pardon because he said, I cannot die unless you pardon me. So I, I have uh, literally forced myself to come. I don't know how to face you, but I have come with this hope that you're going to forgive me. Amazing. I said, come, let's go and have coffee together. <laughs> and we had coffee. He has become an ally to the LGBT community. Wow. wow. He, he is, he has, uh, he has, uh, I, I didn't even want to know who had hired you, nothing. Fine, you, you come here, you accepted your, uh, your guilt, you accepted uh, Beautiful. Uh, your thing. Uh, I, I said, uh, you, uh, you are most eligible to get pardoned. You know, yeah. and today he's become an ally. So uh, I, I have coined one word, uh, which I often use, uh, homophobia in transition. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can make a homo most homophobic person. I mean, this is the word, I mean, this person was, somebody was hired to take my life, you know, which is the most important. I mean, you can get a husband, you can get a house, but you cannot get a life, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, but he's become my ally now. I love this story because it speaks volumes about the content of your character. And it's interesting that you are in service to a community that has struggled for thousands of years to feel comfortable in the role that they've been given to play, number one. And number two, things are opening up now. There is more acceptance, there is more understanding of the community. But there's also a need for support, counseling, uh, protection, um, su you know, shelter. And you opened up a charity and you're involved with so many other charities. Human trafficking is one, which is near, near and dear to your heart. But tell us a little bit about the Luxia Trust yes. mm. and, and the foundation that you've started. Yes. So uh, basically Luxia Trust uh, was started by me and a group of my friends uh, in the year 2000, we are now uh, 22 years old, with the aim that we get give a platform to the LGBT community to come together and we can discuss their issues and how we can uh, resolve them. Because in those days, there was nothing like that happening. And uh, this was the first organization to start in the state of Gujarat from where I am from, which is in the western part of uh, India. And uh, luckily for us, we got uh, government support, which was I never expected, you know, and when we were all treated as criminals by law, the government comes and supports us because HIV had spread in, in our country um, very fast, very rapidly and government realized that uh, if they need to uh, protect us, 
uh, and reduce the infections from spreading. They need to uh, reach out to groups and organizations which who are working with the vulnerable populations. And amongst them was uh, our population, the homosexual population, the transgender population. So HIV came as a blessing in disguise, you know, mm. to, to us. And uh, that's how we started the Lakshya Trust uh, with HIV prevention amongst the uh, homosexual and transgender population. But then we, we thought we should go a step further and go beyond sexual health. And we worked for mental health issues. We have worked for aging issues. <clears throat> we also are one of the first organization in India to start working for the wives of gay men. Wow. Because 80% of gay men in India are married to women. Wow. You know, and most of them are forced because of, of parents' pressures and all. And we are also doing a program for transgenders. Again, government has been quite supportive in that uh, because I think trans rights came much before the gay rights came. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a shelter home exclusively for the transgender, which was inaugurated by the government, uh, Ministry of uh, Social Justice Empowerment. And uh, we were the first organization to have a shelter home. So our shelter, uh, whether it is for trans people or for anyone, uh, aim is to provide not just food and shelter, but to see that how we could give them empowerment through job opportunities, through skill buildings, so that they are in that, this is a home, this is a transit home for them. Beautiful. We give them that confidence so that they can go out and face the homophobic world. Beautiful. With, uh, with, uh, because see, homophobia is going to bound to be there. Yeah. We will not be able to eliminate it totally. Right. But we can at least give confidence to these individuals to face the world. That's beautiful. So that's that's, beautiful. that's what Lakshya is doing, uh, amongst many other things. So even though the government is supporting it, how can the public support it? See, I think it has to be a combination of everyone. It is not, we can't just depend on government. We have to uh, uh, take support from a uh, lot of groups, lot of, and for that reason, I think one of the things which I'm doing now is creating allies. Uh, ally for me is a very important individual or an organization or institution who is not LGBT from the LGBT community. Because if I keep telling people, please support us, please accept us, they will say, well, you are gay, you will naturally tell something in yeah. your favor. But if an ally tells, then people take it seriously. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And I see you as a very important ally. Yes. I mean, if you tell uh, people that please support them, people will take it seriously, they will listen to you. Yeah. So I'm trying to create allies because it is the allies who will help us mainstream our issues in the society. Beautiful. We need allies and, and we are we are doing that. We are doing creating allies in political parties, parliamentarians, religious leaders, educational institutions, media, parents. Parents are one of our very good allies. We have an organization in India now, uh, which is similar to PFLAG, which is an organization started by parents. Uh, and those parents who have accepted their children as gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and these parents are helping out other parents. Wonderful. If a mom speaks to another mom, I think she can she can convince that other mom much better than I can convince the mom. Sure, other. sure. Because they're going yeah. through it together. Exactly. So yeah. they're experiencing mm -hmm. it. Um, I have to say that your openness and naturalness reeks loudly and with such value and, and authenticity, which is refreshing for any community, period, for any community. One of the things that I loved is that you also love meditation and yoga and i think one of the things you should do is to become a voice to tell everyone not just in the lbgtq community but the importance of meditation tell me why meditation yoga your spiritual practice is so important to you yeah i think you asked a very relevant uh, question and especially to a person like me uh, see, I was undergoing a lot of mental stress and um, uh, this, I was disturbed, uh, first of all, with a broken marriage with a woman <laughs> and then coming to terms with my sexuality and then having a nervous breakdown and all. So I, at point, all points of time, I realized that uh, uh, if I need to be balanced in my life, I, if I need to be stable, then uh, I have to adopt to some methods by which will keep me, you know, in, in that form and then I don't kind of give up or lose hope. So uh, these practices have has definitely helped me and of, I don't call myself religious, mm -hmm. but I call myself spiritual. Yeah, I believe in a higher reality. I believe that there is uh, something which is beyond our soul, that there is a supreme soul is there, which is yeah. which is controlling us. And with that belief uh, in mind, and of course, practices like meditation and yoga have, have tremendously helped me 
to maintain that equilibrium, uh, uh, the balance between mental and physical and uh, and spiritual and uh, moral and uh, total health, as I call it. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I I was fortunate to have been uh, trained in a one of the uh, India's very old and renowned uh, institute called the Yoga Institute mm -hmm. in in Bombay, in Mumbai, where I was living. And um, uh, those principles, which I have not just implemented in my life, but I, I share it with people so that if I have benefited with that, then I'm sure it will help other people as well. So I've, I've been spreading the word and uh, I didn't want to kind of uh, uh, call myself a teacher, mm -hmm. but my, my, my teacher, my yoga teacher from whom I learned, uh, he said, no, we need to uh, spread awareness, yeah. which will help other individuals. If you have helped, then uh, it's our duty to help other people as well. Absolutely. So I started doing that. And I think that is one of the reasons uh, how I was able to win the hearts of the people of Rajpipla, even after I came out and I, I suffered the brickbacks. Because uh, I remember there was a film, a uh, documentary film, which was done on me. Uh, and um, you know, they cover all aspects of me, not just sexuality, but me as a musician. I also play the harmonium and yoga and meditation and organic farming. And at the end of the film, uh, uh, it was the producer who thought about this favorite uh, word of me based on what people have told. Her. And this, they ended the film saying, the people's prince. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so that's beautiful. Uh, I think uh, I, I like doing that. I like doing being in public. I like uh, helping people in whatever uh, uh, I have been helped from. Yeah, I noticed uh, that you're so. very comfortable wherever you are. And that's a powerful gift to, you know, to say the least. It's very powerful. Um, looking into the future. What does Prince Manvendra Singh Gohil of the Rajpipla dynasty wish for within the next five years? What do you feel is the next thing for you? See, next thing as a uh, uh, LGBT rights activist, uh, I uh, am. Uh, this is my short term. I will first talk about the short term, and then I will I will talk about the long term. So uh, it's of course I am fighting for the LGBT rights as a uh, as a rights based activist, but I'm not just LGBT rights activist. I'm also call myself more as a human rights activist, working for many causes like uh, um, uh, animal rights, tribal rights, women rights, um, all those who have been uh, not privileged enough. So I would like to see that uh, uh, whether you're an animal, you're a human, or even say plant or a living thing. Uh, uh, th there's equality, there's the, the, they have given their due rights, their, their rights are not violated, uh, and there's no discrimination happens. Yeah, that yeah. is my that is my kind of a, you can say, uh, the short term goal or something. My long term, uh, I have been getting this uh, feeling, and I think I shared it with you in the past also, that uh, this keeps coming to me very often. And uh, I always feel that um, uh, uh, I would like to see uh, peace. Yeah, uh, peace is something which which keeps coming, and uh, and it's not when I say peace, it's not just about wars happening, which is happening. I mean, uh, all kinds of internal peace, external peace, with peace within yourself yeah. and amongst others, peace and brotherhood. Yeah, this is yeah. something which keeps that. I would like to see a world which which has total peace. Yeah. And uh, and there's the other one. There is I I even imagine the worst people together, you know, yeah. who are who are kind of uh, having fun, having enjoy. And when I imagine, I feel I I feel really happy. When I just even if I imagine it, uh, it may or may not happen. I don't know. But even my imagination, and uh, I feel happy. And I think for me, mental satisfaction of seeing others happy makes me feel happy. Beautiful. So that's the way I look at. Mm -hmm. right? Well, you are an absolute gift to our planet, and we thank you so much for the work that you are doing now, but also for the work that you will be called to do. Your courage, your authenticity, your honesty, your warmth are the qualities that are needed to help people to accept everything. You know, we need to stop being very critical and judgmental because people are just different. And I think now we need to recognize that there's beauty in the difference and that the difference is actually evolving us into becoming a better society. So we thank you. Thank for you so much. Your yeah. seva, your contribution, and your heart. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before we close off? 
Yes, I, I always like to say one thing to all those who listen to me. Um, please love yourself. I do that. I love myself. I look at, I am a kind of a narcissist. I look <laughs> at myself in the mirror. And I just love myself. And uh, if you are able to love yourself, I think you will be able to love so many other people. You will be able to reduce hatred. You will be able to reduce phobia. And you will definitely would contribute towards making this beautiful earth a more beautiful place to live. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. That was such a heartwarming interview and time well spent. You know, if you get a chance, you'll be able to also get some candid moments of me spending the day with Prince Manbendra today. I've learned how being a beautiful heart makes an atmosphere a much better space. And I have to tell you this, that if you ever wake up one day or find yourself judging yourself or judging others, boy, have you lost the purpose of being here. So I'm just inviting all of you, if you've not learned anything from this interview, learn one thing, acceptance. But maybe be a little bit also as a narcissist, look in the mirror every day and just say, I love myself, I love myself, I just love myself. And see what might just come out where you'll be able to forgive your enemies in a second because that's exactly what love will do. Thank you so much for joining us on air today. Remember to leave us a message of whatever questions or ideas or thoughts or feedback that you took from the show today. And remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission. And I suspect that we're really here to cultivate the ability to love everybody the same. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Meditation intimate experiences with the divine through contemplative practices my new book that is out on amazon barnes and noble and you can get it from sacred stories publishing or on america meditating radio the quieter you become the more you're able to hear one of my opening pages of this book i have heard time and time again that when you go into the stories and the narratives of the 37 authors that are sharing with you their mystical experiences of the divine something in you changes it has already reached number one three times in mysticism category and the new age category for new releases i want you to get a copy for yourself and tell me what you feel as a result of closing that final page of this book meditation intimate experiences with the divine through contemplative practices it's calling you can you hear it <laughs>